Ah, uh, very good evening, all, and uh, welcome to a discussion on a specific disease that is drugs for peptic ulcer disease. Myself, myself, Dr. Bharat Kumar Vedi. I'm the pharmacology faculty in E Gurukul and EBMCI. And uh, at this time of the hour, that is 9 p.m., so we are going to discuss the drugs for peptic ulcer disease. Now, how do we understand the drugs for peptic ulcer disease? How to make this pharmacology more interesting? Now, do we see these cases every day? Do we see these drugs for peptic ulcer disease every day? And before I proceed, I just want to ask, yes, the audio video is fine. Just put your messages, guys, and then I can proceed further. So just tell me whether audio video is fine. Okay, I hope the things are fine. Yes. So drugs for peptic ulcer disease, how do I understand this topic and uh, what are the aspects I need to know about this topic is the question. Now in pharmacology, remember what you need to understand is three P's. The P, P and P. What is the three, three P's? P is the physiology, then the pathology, then pharmacology. That means you should know what is normal, that is physiology, and then the abnormal, that is the pathology. And when you know the abnormal thing, then you have to know the treatment. So the, all these three things, all these three things will, will form a pillar for medicine. So all these three things are the one which will form the pillar for medicine. So if we understand this, what we understand is the medicine. So basics for medicine starts from here. Just a minute. Yeah, so Umesh, yes, thank you. Himanshu, good evening. Arshal, yeah, good evening. Yes, so these are three P's which will tell us and make us understand the topic medicine. The subject medicine is understood by this. Now, what is the pattern of exam which we are going to face in the future? The pattern of exam which we are going to face in the future is nothing but the next pattern. And the next pattern is based on the clinical case-based scenarios. So we'll start the class with the clinical based scenario. So let me take the case. Now you all read this case, a 30 year old female, she comes to the clinic with heartburn. So what are the symptoms? Heartburn, dyspepsia and abdominal pain. She was given capsule pantoprazole 20 milligram morning before food for seven days. Now what is this pantoprazole? Why it was given? Her symptoms did not improve and came back to the clinic. She was ordered an endoscopy. So the endoscopy showed a gastric ulcer and the rapid ureus test was positive for H. pylori. So this is the lady. Imagine that you are the doctor now. You are the one who are seeing the patient now. So this is the case. 30 year old female comes to the clinic with heartburn, dyspepsia, abdominal pain and she was given pantoprazole. Now it didn't improve and she came again and the endoscopy was done and it was shown to be a gastric ulcer positive for H. pylori. Now, how do I treat this lady? How do I treat this lady? So, we'll go with that. Now, first and foremost, to understand this peptic ulcer disease, we should understand what is peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease are two things. One is the gastric ulcer. Peptic ulcer means the ulcer in the stomach, that is gastric ulcer. And one more is the duodenal ulcer. You know these ulcers from the pathology, gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer. Now why the ulcers occur? Before going to that, let me show you an image. Now this is the stomach part, you can see here, this is the stomach and you can see here the ulcer. And one more is the ulcer in the duodenum, so that is called duodenal ulcer. So these are the two ulcers and these two ulcers is the one what we call it as peptic ulcer disease. So before we commence with that, you need to understand one important point. Why the ulcer occurs? Now the ulcer occurs because of gastritis. So the ulcer because of gastritis and the gastritis or duodenitis will lead to the ulcers. 
Now, why ulcers or gastritis occur? Now, in the stomach, you know that there is HCL. But even with HCL, the stomach is not digested. Why? Because we have a thick mucosa which is protecting our stomach from being destroyed by acid. So, in the stomach and duodenum, we have two factors. One is called the aggravating factors which is trying to cause gastritis. And second one is the defensive factor. The aggravating factor is trying to cause gastritis and defensive factor is preventing the gastritis. What are these aggravating factors? Can somebody tell me what are the aggravating factors? What are the defensive factors we have? The defensive factor what we have is the bicarbonate secreted. Then the thick mucosa. So the mucosa of the stomach is thick. And second important aspect is the blood flow. Mucosal blood flow. And uh, one more defensive factor is the prostaglandins, the gastroprotective prostaglandins. These are the one which are going to prevent the ulcer formation or gastritis. Now, yes guys, can you tell me what are the aggravating factors which increases acid production and thereby gastritis? Yes, the major culprit is hydrochloric acid. Very good. Then the pepsin. Then the pepsin. And then we have a bacteria called H. pylori. So in the case we saw that the woman undergone endoscopy and she was shown to have H. pylori. So we know the aggravating factors, defensive factor, usually they are under balance. They are under balance. So once that balance is lost, what we get is the gastritis. That means aggravatory factor may be more, defensive factor may be less, and the gastritis or deodinitis will lead to peptic ulcer disease. Are these the only factors? Are these the only factors now? Patients will have stress. They may take alcohol. They may be smoking or they may be or they may be having irregular food habits. They don't eat at the regular intervals, irregular food habits. So all this will contribute for gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. Yes, Adi, you're right. Hurry, worry, curry, yes. Now tell me guys, if you want to treat peptic ulcer disease, what has to be done? What has to be done? If I want to treat this gastritis, I don't want the gastritis to occur and then peptic ulcer disease. What should be done? Think and tell me. You know the answers. Come on, come on. Arshal, Ivanshu, Vashur, Shoaib, Abdullah, Sayan Mishra. Yes, guys, tell me. The first and foremost thing. Yes, answer me. What you have to do is you have to stop this. So patient education is very, very important. Not only the drugs. When the patient is in your clinic or hospital, educate the patient, see, avoid stress, avoid alcohol, avoid smoking, follow regular food habits. Small frequent meal, For small frequent meal is the one. Second, what you can do is, you can decrease the aggravating factors. You can decrease the aggravating factors, that is the second thing. The third thing what we can do is, we can increase the defense factor. So these are the pharmacological principles how I manage a case of peptic acid disease. Number one, educate the patient. Number two, decrease the aggravating factor that is mainly the HCL and the H. pylori. And then increase the defensive factor that is bicarbonate, prostaglandins and all. This is what basically we need to do so that gastritis will not occur. Very good, Rohit, Kushal, Adi, very good. Now guys, Patient education, you can do that by speaking with a patient, but what about the aggravating factor that is HCL? Which cell secretes HCL? That is my question. Tell me guys, which cell secretes HCL? So let me take that cell and then we will explain what happens. So can you tell me which cell secretes HCL? So I am writing that cell. Which cell secretes HCL? Now this cell in the stomach, it has a pump and through that pump it will eliminate that will throw H plus out and takes potassium inside and that pump is called H plus K plus ATP. Yes many have answered that is nothing but parietal cell. So parietal cells are the one which secrete 
HCL. So the cell is called the parietal cell. So that's what I told you in the beginning. You should know physiology. Then pathology is ulcer. Treatment is pharmacology. So H plus will come. And after that, the chloride enters. So H plus will combine with chloride. And that will form HCL. So that will form HCL. Now if HCL is excess, if HCL is excess, this HCL is going to cause gastritis. So this will cause gastritis or duodenitis. Yes or no? So that excess of HCL can cause gastritis or duodenitis, but usually that will not occur only when there is imbalance. Now if you don't read this ulcer, sorry gastritis, so that will lead to the ulcer, particularly gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer. So this is the ulcer. So this is what we need to treat, patient comes with ulcer. Now what are the other hormones in the body which control this HCL secretion? Now this pump he is throwing H plus out and H plus is also called, you know, H plus is also called as proton. So that's why this is called proton pump. It is called proton pump. Now who are the other hormones which activate this? The other hormone which activate this parietal cell is called histamine. So histamine will activate a receptor called H2 receptor and that will automatically stimulate the pump that is proton pump. Now who will also stimulate histamine release? There is a cell called enterochromaffin cell and it is activated by different receptors like acetylcholine. So it acts on M1 receptor and also by gastrin which acts on cholecystokinin receptor. So they will also tell to secrete histamine. Right. Apart from that directly the acetylcholine can stimulate the M1 receptor and that will also cause increased HCL. Another important receptor is the gastrin. Now gastrin can act on a receptor called CCK1 and that will also stimulate this. That will also stimulate this. Now who is the only one who opposes this is the receptor for prostaglandins. It is E1 bar E2 both are there and that is the only one which inhibits this and prostaglandins increases bicarbonate as well as the increase mucosal blood flow. So which is a protective factor mucosal blood flow right so one is the proton pump h2 vascularic cck they are the one which are going to cause hcl secretion the only one which opposes this is prostaglandin now it is also known that there is an attachment of a bacteria and that is the h pylori so h pylori is the one which is attached to this parietal cell and back this h pylori is also known to produce gastritis and also it is known to produce a cancer called mild lymphoma mild lymphoma right now guys i have given you all the factors and i have told you the pathology now i start my class with physiology then i will come with pathology so i want this pathophysiology now tell me guys penultimately i have to protect the patient from peptic ulcer disease tell me where can i block so what are the points where the drugs can be used so that HCL secretion decreases? So can you tell me now? Come on, come on. You know the answers. Yes. So what are the points where we can use these drugs for decreasing HCL? So where should I stimulate? Where should I block? Come on. Yes. Very good. Number one, you can block the secretion of H+. So we can block the pump and these are called proton pump inhibitors. Number two, what you can do is you can block the receptor H2. So H2 blockers can be used. Number three, you can block the muscularic receptor. Number four, you can block cholecystokinin 1 receptor. And number five, you need not block but you stimulate the prostaglandins. And the number six, what we have for peptic ulcer disease is, is the eradication of H. pylori. So H. pylori eradication. H. 
pylori eradication this can be done clear now what about hcl so hcl is an acid how do i neutralize it i neutralize this by using a group of drugs called antacids so we use antacids for this now what about ulcer ulcer it's like a trauma to your finger or something like that there is some ulcer so you should put a bandage but who will put a bandage inside the stomach so that's why in the stomach we have to use drugs which protect this ulcer so they are called ulcer protectives so these ulcer protectives will form a layer on the ulcer they prevent the ulcer from getting irritated by hcl so the age group of drugs are ulcer protectives yes cyan you are right deepak rao yes right rohitya you are right so if you see this you will see the drugs used for peptic ulcer disease number one proton pump inhibitors number two h2 blockers number three m1 blocker they are also called as anticholinergic drugs number four the blockers of the ck1 number five is prostaglandins stimulation and six you have to eradicate h pylori seventh is antacid and eighth is ulcer protective so this image will give you all the drugs in your mind so if they ask you classification of the drugs everything is here clear so we'll go with the one by one first we'll take up the proton pump inhibitors so the first group of drugs what i am going to discuss is the proton pump inhibitors proton pump inhibitors now as the name tells that they inhibit proton pump and how to identify these drugs in the exam i will give you a clue omeprazole so the end with prazole can you tell me other drug you add s it will become esomeprazole you add lanso panto rabi so in pharmacology most of the times if you remember if you remember the suffix that will only tell you what is the drug so omeprazole esomeprazole lansoprazole pantoprazole rabiprazole now among that some specialties i write there only lansoprazole is found to be safe in pregnant women safe in pregnant compared to others now rabiprazole is a bit long acting drug a bit long acting among all others yes so lansoprazole pantoprazole ilaprazole it's a japan approved company, uh, drug so standard books don't give that uh, yes sir yes now you know the mechanism of action now coming to the pharmacokinetics all these drugs are either given oral or you can give iv but when you give this drugs oral when you give this drug oral they can be destroyed by acid in the stomach see this beauty of this they can be destroyed in the acid of the stomach so what we do is we give them with something called enteric coated tablet so these are called enteric coated tablet now what do you mean by enteric coated tablet that means if this is a tablet if this is a tablet along among that tablet there will be a coating that coating will dissolve only in the intestinal ph not in the acidic ph so that's why it will not degrade in the stomach so when the drug is taken for example let me write that this is the esophagus this is the stomach and this is the intestine so the drug will not disintegrate in the stomach when it comes in the intestine because of the ph of the intestine there only the drug will get disintegrated then gets absorbed that is the meaning of entry coated so one of the aims exam they ask this question what is the meaning of entry coated tablet why it is done to prevent the destruction of the drug in the acidic ph of the stomach so that is the reason that is entry coated now once you understood entry coated the next option is why the drug has to be taken one hour before food can anybody tell me why the drug has to be taken one hour before food anybody so i am seeing your messages you can answer me one hour before food why the drug has to be taken yes you answer that 
now car coming to other aspect now the drug will get absorbed you know that it will get absorbed then go to the liver from the liver it will go to the heart from the heart again it will come to the stomach so in the stomach it will get secreted in the stomach it gets secreted so what happens in the stomach when the drug comes here when the drug comes at the parietal cell so these are the parietal cell i am just writing the beautiful parietal cell so when they reach the stomach there is something called canaliculi in the canaliculi the proton pump inhibitors get secreted now proton pump inhibitors in the stomach canaliculi they become an active moiety called sulfonamide not sulfonamide it is called sulfonamide now that's the meaning that all ppis are pro drugs all ppis are pro drugs that means they have to be metabolized to get an active moiety so this sulfonamide is the one which blocks the proton pump the proton pump is blocked by not ppis but its active metabolite that is sulfonamide and what about this inhibition this inhibition of the pump is irreversible the inhibition of the pump is irreversible irreversible so please remember all this ppi are pro drugs in the canaliculi they will become sulfonamide that will block the proton pump irreversible irreversible remember that now i asked you a question why one hour before food now the drug should be taken one hour before food because when the person start taking the food the salivation increases the hcl secretion increases so when the hcl secretion increases then the drug should be available at the site of action that means the pump should be active so this drug will only block the active pumps not the inactive or resting pumps now that's the reason it has to be taken one hour before food so when the person takes the food it takes the food the drug should have reached this spot so to do that it takes time so that's why one hour before food and a person takes the food the pumps become active so the pumps become active and remember they don't block all the pumps in the stomach they block only the active pumps so they will block around 70% of active pumps if you give one tablet now to block all the 100% of pump it takes 3 to 5 days to block all the pumps in the stomach all pumps in the stomach so it has to be 3 to 5 days after that all the pumps are blocked and that is why we call this as biological lag so it will not act immediately and block all the pump it will take 3 to 5 days to block all the pumps because 70% 70% is blocked and after next day another few pumps will become active then so only the active pumps are blocked that's why it takes 3 to 5 to 5 days to get all this plug blocked now if you stop the drug and as it how many days is required to get back all the pumps anybody can you answer how many days are required to get back all the pumps again to work normally so answer this i will be back now i was discussing this guys pro drugs and they become sulfonamide and they block the pump irreversible now irreversible means if this is the enzyme the drug binds here and it will not leave the enzyme at all that means suicide the enzyme will not be synthesized at all i mean that enzyme is gone so fresh enzyme has to be synthesized the meaning of irreversible means the enzyme which is present or the pump which is present is blocked and it will not come back again so the cell has to synthesize it fresh so that's why it is called irreversible now tell me guys the half life of most of the drugs t half is around 1 to 2 hours all of this proton pump inhibitors act for half life of 1 to 2 hours then tell me why how many times in a day you have taken this ppis half life is only 1 to 2 hours so how many times in a day have taken answer me this guys if you stop this again to regain the pump it takes another 3 to 5 days another 3 to 5 days to regain all the pumps all the pumps so same thing to block how many days to regain the same number of days are required 
now the half life of the drug is one to two hours so tell me guys how many times in a day have you taken is it two hours means you have taken 12 times in a day is it so no most of the times it is given once daily or it is given twice daily that's it now why this is because these drugs are called hit and run drugs these are called hit and run drugs that means they block the pump irreversible so 70 percent of pump are irreversibly blocked now again acid secretion should occur it takes time because the cell has to synthesize new enzyme new pump it takes time so that's why even though they are there for one to two hours their action will be there for 12 to 24 hours so the action lasts for 12 to 24 hours now that is what we mean by hit and run drugs that means they hit the target and they disappear from plasma but their effect lasts for 12 to 24 hours and that's why these are called hit and run drugs clear so that is the pharmacokinetic importance i have to tell you let me repeat again guys it's entry coated to be taken one hour before food now there is a biological lag all these are pro drugs they inhibit the pump irreversibly even the half life is very short their action is very long because of the phenomenon hit and run drugs now one more important point which is absurd nowadays is with omeprazole now drug omeprazole inhibits an enzyme called cytochrome 2c19 so it inhibits an enzyme called cyp2c19 that is the enzyme blocked by omeprazole now one more important point i will tell you a drug called clopidogrel clopidogrel can you tell me guys what is this clopidogrel where do we use it at least which group clopidogrel has to become active why because clopidogrel is a pro drug pro drug now this clopidogrel which is a pro drug is activated by an enzyme called cyp2c19 so that is the enzyme required now what happens if the patient is taking omeprazole plus clopidogrel together we call it as drug interaction what happens if both are taken together now if both are taken together omeprazole is an enzyme inhibitor so it inhibits the action of cyp2c19 so clopidogrel and many have answered that it's an antiplatelet drug so clopidogrel is an antiplatelet drug even the patient is taking the drug the drug will not become active why omeprazole is not allowing that to become active it is inhibiting the enzyme cyp2c19 so usually we use this clopidogrel as an antiplatelet in stroke or mi now what is the clinical application guys now if you are a doctor yeah you're all doctors only when you start your practicing now will you combine omeprazole plus clopidogrel now what happens if clopidogrel omeprazole are given together you just comment here just comment guys so this is the drug interaction now after we understood the drug interaction pharmacokinetics now let us move on to the users where to use this proton pump inhibitors users number one so if we use it in peptic ulcer disease yes that's what we are discussing second we use in a condition called GERD GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disorder that means patients will have acid they will have the acid coming to the esophagus so that is called GERD number three it is used for H pylori eradication so it is one of the drug used for H pylori eradication. Uh, so I asked you guys, what happens now? Suppose a patient takes omeprazole plus clopidogrel, he will not have protection for stroke and MI. So patient may end up with stroke and MI if both are given combination. And that's why this question is repeatedly asked and many patients are suffered with MI. So this combination should not be used. Now moving on to the uses. Peptic ulcer disease, GERD, H pylori eradication and also there is a condition where there is excess of gastrin what is that condition called anybody there is a condition where there is excess of gastrin that is called zollinger ellison zollinger ellison syndrome so it is nothing but excessive gastrin which will lead to gastritis so there we use it number five it is used in gastric ulcer bleeding 
so many a times you know ulcer ulcers will bleed so similarly if a gastric ulcer bleeds what happens if there is a ulcer and if it starts bleeding so blood vessel starts bleeding there is a formation of clot so there is a formation of clot so clot formation will occur now the clot will not get stabilized because the acid in the stomach is trying to dissolve the clot so the clot will not be able to form you know that if there is a clot then only bleeding stops but the acid in the stomach is not allowing the clot to form so what should i do now i should use ppi and the ppi will decrease the acid the ppi will decrease the acid and that is responsible for dissolving the clot so that's why we can use it in gastric ulcer bleeding yes when you have answered anmol you are right yes sir rohit yes you are right cyan you are right number 6 they are also used as pre anesthetic medication so before anesthesia now before anesthesia why do you use it because we need to decrease the gastric secretions we should decrease the gastric secretion because the secretions may get aspirated in the lung during anesthesia so these are the major uses let me repeat peptic ulcer disease gerd h pyle eradication zollinger ellison syndrome gastric ulcer bleeding pre anesthetic medication number 7 they can also be used in nsaid induced ulcer so whenever the painkillers are given like aspirin diclofenac they can cause ulcer that's why most of the physicians if you see when they give painkillers they will give proton pump inhibitors to prevent this because nsaids decrease prostaglandins i told you prostaglandins are protective but when i give nsaids they decrease prostaglandins that's why i have to cover that gastric ulcer by giving peptides uh, by by giving ppis so for nsaid induced ulcer the drug of choice are ppis proton pump inhibitors and they are also used in ulcers called stress ulcers now stress ulcers occurs during surgery or during some infection and all to prevent that what we use is ppis yes beautiful drugs every doctor prescribes that now do they pro- cause any problem do they cause any problem guys yes so let us see what are the adverse effect of the drug number 1 most of the patient complain headache and abdominal pain that is a point now the number second now when we give this ppis they increase the ph of the stomach so the acidic ph will rise further it will not become more and more acidic but it will more, try to become more and more alkaline so the ph gets elevated in the stomach now what is the problem now the problem what we face is if ph rises now acid ph is required for converting ferric form to ferrous form to convert ferric form to ferrous form what we require is acidic ph now if i give this iron preparation for a patient the acidic ph is not present properly so iron absorption decreases because the iron which gets absorbed is the ferrous form fe2 plus so that's why we don't recommend patient to take ppa plus iron because the iron absorption require acidic ph so most of the patients may come back with an anemia so you have to answer this what type of anemia if there is iron deficiency you have to tell me the peripheral smear now the second important thing is why the nature has given us acid the acid is the one which protects us if we take some bacteria some organisms they are destroyed because of the acid ph now when we elevate that ph many a times there are chances that there is an infection called pseudo membranous enterocolitis pseudo membranous enterocolitis may occur so that is a complication now apart from that there will be decrease beta will absorption and decrease calcium absorption which will lead to the megaloblastic anemia as well as osteoporosis right and these are the major complication and also there may be a cases of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in few people but mainly it is pseudo membranous enterocolitis yes many have answered that iron if it is decreased can cause microcytic hypochromic anemia apart from that the third complication that will occur is if the ppis are used for very long time so they will not allow the gastric mucosa to work so that will work cause 
atrophic gastritis because when you stop that proton pump continuously the proton pump will forget their function so the parietal cell will undergo atrophy so there will be atrophic gastritis number four there will be increased gastrin now gastrin will try to increase acid because acid is less because of ppis so there may be reflux increase in gastrin level fifth it can also cause acute kidney injury acute kidney injury not everywhere in few people so you should be very careful number six in rats not in humans it has shown to cause teratoma so in pregnant woman you should be careful if you're using in pregnant woman you should be careful right so that are the complications what we see with the ppis headache abdominal pain and when the ph gets elevated so this is the complication and in your exam if you want to know one more drug interaction that is the interaction between pp and iron should not be given together because ppi elevate the ph so ferrous that is ferric will not become ferrous so absorption decreases and that will lead to microcytic hypochromic anemia so that is a complication guys yeah so once we are done with that we are done with ppis now let us go to the second target what is the second target the second targets are H2 blockers. H2 blockers. Now please understand the physiology. Acid secretion occurs in two ways. One is suppose this is the basal level. Acid secretion occurs basal acid secretion. So this is called basal acid output. So throughout the day it will be secreted. That is very minute quantity. Now whenever a person takes food there is one more acid secretion that occurs and that is called stimulated acid secretion that means whenever somebody eats the acid should get released so that is called stimulated acid secretion now both this acid secretion is decreased by the ppa so ppa is decreased both this but the h2 blockers they mainly decrease the basal acid output so basal acid output is blocked by decreased by H2 blockers. Now, why it is important basal acid output? Most of the patients come with the midnight, sir. I have gastritis in the night, and because that gastritis in the night is usually because of increased basal acid output. Suppose you want to control a very good, uh, very good acid, external acid secretion, then the best drugs are H2 blockers. In the morning, you can give PPA, and evening, you can give H2 blockers. So, that is the advantage. Now, coming to the drug name. The drug names are, yes, SR has given the name, ranitidine. Let me write a drug. It is called simetidine. Simetidine we don't use anywhere, but we use it for only MCQ purpose. Simetidine causes problems such as gynecomastia, loss of libido. So who wants to take this drug and get all these problems? So that's why it is not used. Along with that, it's an enzyme inhibitor. It's an enzyme inhibitor. So what is commonly used nowadays is the drug called ranitidine, then famotidine, loxatidine. Now they all end with tidine. So tidine, tidine, tidine. Right? So don't confuse with the drug called amantadine. So it ends with tadine. It is tidine drugs. Now where do you use this? These drugs are also used for the peptic ulcer disease, the GERD, and also for pre-anesthetic pre-anesthetic medication so same thing but nowadays for every gastritis what we use is ppis because ppa have maximum efficacy because wherever the h2 stimulates where the histamine stimulates or the acetylcholine stimulates penultimately the final step is blocked by h2 sorry ppis so that's why that have maximum efficacy that's why we use them better than h2 blockers yes now coming to the third group they are anticholinergics. Can anybody tell me the drug names, guys? So I'll be happy. So can you tell me the uh, drug names which are anticholinergics used for peptic ulcer disease? Fourth one is CCK1 blockers. So we don't have any drug till now. So still the research is going on for that. So once you finish your exams, you have time. So you can do research with that. Anticholinergic drugs, what we use for peptic ulcer disease are pyrenzepine. Now, pyrenzepine was asked as an MCQ in one of the NEAT exam. They asked which of the following drug used for gastritis. So, one of the options was pyrenzepine. 
and one more is telenzepine so these are the anticholinergic drugs yes and mole you are right now the fifth target is the prostaglandins now in prostaglandins we have prostaglandin e1 analog now that drug is called mesoprostol mesoprostol now guys how do we identify prostaglandins in the exam all of them have prost in their name either in the middle or in the end so prost mesoprostol now mesoprostol is one of the drug used to treat peptic ulcer disease and also it is one of the drug used for nsaid induced ulcer now nsaid induced ulcer is because of decreased prostaglandins but what we use is mesoprostol which is going to replenish prostaglandins now where you should not use it you should not use it in a pregnant woman why prostaglandin can also deliver that means it will cause the contraction of the uterus a pregnant woman comes to your clinic and she has peptic ulcer disease and you give misoprostol you will deliver the air only so that's why very good yes sir apart efficient second it is contraindicated in inflammatory bubble disease now you tell me guys why it is contraindicated in inflammatory bubble disease anybody so i'll be very happy if you answer this question why it is contraindicated in inflammatory bowel disease so it's a simple thing but you, you will answer that don't worry right that is about misoprostol we don't routinely use this in practice but uh, in nsaid induced ulcers it's a more specific drug but the drug of choice is ppis now the sixth target is the h pylori we have to throw this h pylori out so h pylori eradication so what are the drugs what we use for h pylori eradication even if you are uh, wrong tell me guys why it is contracted in inflammatory bowel disease number one we use ppis the antimicrobials what we use is amoxicillin please remember it is amoxicillin next one is clarithromycin clarithromycin then we use tetracyclines tetra cyclines then we use metronidazole now one of the reasons what is given in the book why they are contraindicated in inflammatory bowel disease is one is they can increase the contraction second one is prostaglandins themselves are inflammatory mediators so in inflammatory conditions we usually avoid these prostaglandins so that is one reason yes very good uh, chakra chakra teja very good very good so that's what same question was asked in one of the aims exam recently prostaglandins are contracted in which glaucoma inflammatory glaucoma wherever there is inflammation we don't use that prostaglandins because they are only pro inflammatory drugs very good very good and we can use the derivative of that that is tinidazole and one more is colloid bismuth substrate colloid bismuth substrate now bismuth is to be taken carefully otherwise it may cause bismuth toxicity which will cause renal osteodystrophy so that is a problem with the drug otherwise safer if you are using it at the normal dose otherwise the main problem that is adverse effect is renal osteodystrophy sir so many drugs are there sir which one should we use to eradicate h pylori there are certain regimens regimens contain one or two drugs and there is some duration for treatment so what is the regimen that is followed sir so remember as oca ocm oc m and ob tm these are the regimens OCA. Remember O for any proton pump inhibitors, any proton pump inhibitors, and C for clarithromycin, clarithromycin, and A for amoxicillin. Usually the proton pump inhibitor what we use is lansoprazole. You can use anything, but lansoprazole plus clarithromycin amoxicillin. It is given twice a day for fourteen days. that is the regimen approved by us fda 
So the regimen for HPL eradication is lansoprazole, clarithromycin, amoxicillin twice a day for 14 days that is approved by USFDA. So what is USFDA? Anybody? Yes. Now OCM can also be used, same clarithromycin, the PPI, the name for metronidazole. OBTM, O for the PPI, B for bismuth and T for the tetracycline and M for metronidazole. Right, so usually we use this regimen, three drugs is called triple drug regimen, four drug is called quadruple drug regimen, that's it. Now when do we use triple drug regimen in the beginning? If there is a resistance issue, then we call, go for quadruple drug regimen. There are sequential regimens also that will be teach, taught in the medicine. So we'll stick to this basics. Now the treatment should be for 14 days and most of the patients I have seen because when I did my MD pharmacology, my own thesis, my own PG thesis was on H. pylori. Right, so you know, you know who discovered this H. pylori? Marshall. So he wanted to tell the people that H. pylori is the one which was causing ulcer but nobody believed. So what he did is he took H. pylori and he drank himself. So then after a few, few days uh, ulcers occurred. So then he demonstrated that. So that is how the H. pylori came into the existence. Yes, Cyan, you are right, US Food and Drug Administration, that is the point. So we are done with the eradication. Now what we are coming to the thing is, seventh one is antacids. Antacids. Now antacids, they neutralize the acid immediately. Now there are two types, one is called systemic antacid and one is called the non-systemic antacid. Now systemic antacids are nothing but sodium bicarbonate which people drink as soda. But what happens when they drink soda? Sodium bicarbonate combines with hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So what they get is free sodium chloride, water and carbon dioxide. This is what happens. Is it good? Yes, the acid gets neutralized but the problem is sodium chloride. If the patient is having hypertension, sodium chloride gets absorbed. If the patient is having CHF, then it is not to be given. But what happens with the carbon dioxide? So carbon dioxide tries to escape out. So you will have burping. So that's why when you drink soda water, you will have burp. Oh. So carbonated drinks, they will have. But that is not an issue. But the issue is, if the patient is having a ulcer in the stomach and it is about to rupture any time. So when you give this soda, Carbon dioxide will exert pressure everywhere and there may be chances that a pressure is put on the ulcer. So there may be ulcer perforation. Ulcer perforation guys. So that's why please don't suggest anybody this carbonated drinks or soda when they get gastritis. We don't know inside the stomach there may be gastritis, there may be ulcer which is about to rupture. That's why these are not preferred. And this sodium bicarbonate itself can cause metabolic alkalosis in individuals. So that's why the usage of systemic antacid has come down now. We don't use it in practice. What we use is non-systemic antacids. Now the non-systemic antacid is magnesium hydroxide and one more is aluminum hydroxide. Now they don't produce carbon dioxide. They don't get absorbed but very less quantity. Now these magnesium causes diarrhea, aluminum causes constipation. Now guys, which one will you give to the, your patient? Whether you will give magnesium hydroxide or aluminum hydroxide? They are the antacids, right? So which one will you give to your patient? Tell me. So patient has come to you, you want to give an antacid, so which one will you give? You tell me the answer. Now one more preparation is called Magaldrate. So it is also a compound which contains magnesium and aluminium. Now, diarrhea or constipation, we don't want that. So always we combine these drugs and give. So when we combine the drugs, the side effect decreases. So that's why if you see an antacid syrup, it's a combination of two. It's a combination of two. So we use the combinations in, uh, in ulcers or gastritis. Yes, you're right. Yes, sir, combination. Now non-systemic antacids or antacids, they are the fastest acting drugs. Fastest and they give quick relief. 
suppose somebody in the midnight they want quick relief from acid they have to take this antacid but the problem with antacids is they have to take it every two two hours because you are not going to stop the acid the acid will be there coming back again and again so you have to neutralize by repeatedly drinking that that's the main problem with the antacids that's why they are not popular they are only for short period of time they will provide, provide you quick relief so this was the question asked in neat exam which one will produce quick relief it is the antacids now moving on to the last one the eighth one is the ulcer protectives so we have to protect ulcer ulcer protectives now why should i protect ulcer because when there is a ulcer in the stomach the hcl keeps on irritating so ulcer will not heal now why do you put a bandage on the ulcer so that the external environment will not disturb that so healing occurs gradually now i don't i cannot put a bandage inside so what i do is i use a drug called sucralfate what is the name sucralfate and this will at the ph less than 4 if the ph is less than 4 it will form a polymer so it will go inside and cause polymerization so it will undergo polymerization so it will undergo polymerization so that it will form a bandage like that means it will protect the ulcer so once the protection is given the ulcer will heal from below so healing occurs so the drug is called sucralfate and remember it contains aluminium now aluminium compo com uh, containing compound should not be used in renal failure so sucralfate is contraindicated in renal failure because the aluminium can get retained so sucralfate is contraindicated in renal failure because it contains aluminium now sucralfate one more property is it binds phosphate it binds phosphate ions now you tell me guys which condition i can use it it's an advantage which condition i can use it it binds phosphate so which condition i can use it now my another question is suppose you are a company pharma company and you want to give two things to a patient you will see prepare a syrup sucralfate plus antacids you want to give them together to the patient so will you give it or not so you have to answer me yes or no should we give it or not yes answer this now it binds phosphate so i can use it in the treatment of the condition where phosphate is high is nothing but hyperphosphatemia that's it guys hyperphosphatemia yes but what about sucralfate and antacid can we combine them together and give it to the patient yes or no no yes anmol you are right because when i give the antacids you know that sucralfate will act only with the ph less than 4 now when i combine with antacids they elevate the ph and when they elevate the ph more than 4 the drug will not work sucralfate will not work so this combination should not be used and that's why we don't have this combination otherwise you would have seen all the pharma company coming with the combination of sucralfate and antacids that's not possible clear so please understand sucralfate contains aluminium it is not used in renal failure one more aspect you need to understand sucralfate is to be given before food so it has to be given one hour before food and it has to be administered frequently that is four times in a day that's the problem now the last one i want to discuss is suppose there is severe pain because of ulcer do we have a local anesthetic do we have a local anesthetic and the local anesthetic that is given for the pain relief is oxita cane so oxita cane is a local anesthetic which is given as syrup so usually it comes with sucralfate plus oxita cane in case of ulcers so pain will be decreased by local anesthetic right so very good animal this is the answer now guys we have seen what is peptic ulcer disease there are two things one is gastric and duodenal ulcers we know that there is something called aggravating and uh, the defensive factor we have to decrease the aggravating factor increase defensive factor i came up with the diagram what is the parietal cell then i told you where are the targets where i have to use so that i can treat the disease and we started with the case 
and then I discuss proton pump inhibitors, how they end, what are their pharmacokinetics, why they are given a centric coated tablet, then why they are taken one hour before put, why they are called hit and run drugs, what are the uses, what are the, uh, then what are the adverse effects of that, then H2 blockers that we discussed, the anticholinergic drugs, then the, the prostaglandins where it is contraindicated, then we discussed uh, the antacids, the H poly eradication, what are the regimens, and then we came back to the sucralfate concept. Okay, so this is what I had to discuss with the peptic acid disease. Now, the class will not end with this because we have to ask you some questions. Now, let me take some reasons. You have to answer me this, guys. Now, you answer this point. Why S2 blockers are effective in inhibiting noxal acid secretion? The reason is they decrease basal acid output. So, that's why they are effective in inhibiting noxal acid secretion. Now, H. pylori produced induced gastritis precedes the development of ulcers in most of the person because H. pylori induces gastritis. And DT will induce inflammation because of that only patients will have gastritis and then ulcers. Semitidine causes gynecomastia as adverse effect because semitidine, it blocks androgen activity. So, androgen activity is blocked. That's why it will cause gynecomastia in a male. Proton inhibitors have overtaken H2 blockers in treatment of peptic ulcer disease. Why? The reason is simple. Proton pump inhibitors have maximum efficacy compared to all the drugs that I discussed. Now, PPA should be taken in empty stomach. You know the reason. Because it will inhibit the active pumps and the drug should be present when the pumps are active. PPAs are used in treatment of bleeding peptic ulcer. The reason is the clot will dissolve in the acid. So, I don't want the clot to dissolve. So, I want to decrease the acid secretion that's why i use ppas ppas reduce the clinical efficacy of clopidogrel because clopidogrel is a pro drug an antiplatelet drug it has to become active so that activation is inhibited by ppas mainly omeprazole pranitidine is preferred over semitrine in clinical practice because semitrine causes gynecomastia and all why magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide are combined you know the reason magnesium causes diarrhea aluminum causes constipation Sucralfate works at pH less than 4 because of that pH only it will work and it will polymerize. If the pH is more than that, it will not work. Why antacids are not given along with sucralfate? Yes, guys, you know the answer. Sucralfate is contraindicated renal failure. Why? Because it contains aluminum. So these are the reasonings I had to give you and ask the questions. Now I only gave the answers, but we'll not leave here. So I'll ask you some of the MCQs. So take your time answer this question. Question number. Yes, read this question and I will be waiting for your answer, guys. Yes, yes, come on. Elderly woman with a recent history of MI is seeking a medical medication to help her occasional heartburn. She is currently taking several medication: aspirin, clopidogrel, simvastatin, metoprolol, and lisinopril. Which of the following choices should be avoided in this patient? Come on which has to be avoided. Calcium citrate, pomotidine, omeprazole, ranitidine, which one has to be avoided? Come on, come on, come on. Very good. Patient is on clopidogrel and omeprazole should not be taken because, yes, you are right, Basir Rahman, you are right. Now coming on to the next question, which one of the following drug polymerase at pH less than 4 and helps in gastric ulcer healing? Now I want to give you a trick. See solving an MCQ doesn't mean that you will get a right answer. Most of you will get a right answer. I am agreeing with that. So the answer for this, I will be waiting for your answers. Now when you solve an MCQ, remember you have to take the options into consideration. Now what is Rebiprazole? Rebiprazole, I told you, ending with prazole, they are PPAs. Mesoprostol, prostol, so it's a prostaglandins. Ranitidins, they are H2 blockers. Now, sucralfate is an ulcer healing drug. Ulcer healing drug, so the answer will be this. So, when you solve an MCQ, please don't stick to the answer. I know you will all answer sucralfate, but I want all of you to answer the other options also. That is how we learn the subject that is how we remember that for very long time clear yes yes the last one
32 year old patient visited to your OPD with a history of recurrent peptic ulcer with H. pylori which antibiotic is not appropriate for use as an oral agent in the treatment of recurrent peptic ulcer acid with H. pylori so simply previously the examiner used to ask all the following drugs are used in H. pylori eradication except now that is not the case they are giving the some cases in the beginning and then they are asking so it's a case of H. pylori infection so we have to remove that H. pylori what are the drugs used do we use amoxicillin yes do we use clarithro yes do we use metronidazole yes so what we don't use is vancomycin what we don't use is vancomycin so the answer will be vancomycin so when you solve this type of mcqs you keep it in your mind what are the other antimicrobials we use metronidazole tenidazole tetracyclines and also colloid bisphenol substrate along with that ppas so this is how we have to conclude this mcqs so in my class i will be dealing like this guys first i will introduce to a case then i will go with physiology then pathology then the drugs and then i will come to reasoning then i will solve mcqs and i will come back to the case which i started this was a case 30 year old female comes to the clinic with heartburn now why she was given pantoprazole because we suspected gastritis here so pantoprazole was given but still the symptoms did not improve she came back she was ordered endoscopy and showed gastric ulcer and it was positive for H. pylori. So here, what is the treatment guys? What is the treatment for this lady? Yes, this was the lady who was, who was sitting in your clinic in the beginning and you are the doctor. So what will you do for this lady now? Yes, what will you do for this lady? You are given behind a process for seven days. Now you found out that she has H. pylori. What will you do? Yes, so we will give a triple drug regimen that is lansoprazole, amoxicillin and carithromycin for 14 days. That is the regimen that is followed. Yes, so thank you all and thank you for thank you for your patience and answering very well. And uh, yes, thank you for interacting and most of them answered very well. So I am very much impressed with that. So just give your opinion. How was the class? Do you enjoy so anything to be improved in the class so this is how we plan the classes and we go with the pharmacology because pharmacology as such is not drug it's the application part what we have to learn in pharmacology not only the drugs so all these are practical points i told you sucralfate then i told you sucralfate should not be combined with antacids why ppa should be taken before food so all these are applied aspect which is useful not only for your mcqs for your future also right so that's it guys, so we'll end up the session here. Myself, Dr. Bharat Kumar Vidi, your Pharma Guru. We'll meet up again and again, and this is one of the session we have started. So thank you, so leave your feedback, and we'll be very happy to hear from you all. Good night, take care. So it's already 10 o'clock, so sleep well, take care, because sleep is also important, so if you sleep well, the acid secretion decreases much. Okay, thank you all. Okay, thank you, SR, Shoaib, Adi, SR, Mysur, Salaimul Ansari,